Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we want to say, oh yeah, I have to talk right into the microphone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, this is a topic that is super exciting to the four of us up here. Uh, we've been talking about using Twitter and sharing out on Twitter from our education and our learning departments over the last year or even longer. Um, so welcome to using Twitter to give everyone a voice, empowering staff and capturing learner experience. If you get the chance to tweet or share out, we made our own hashtag so that people can follow this as well. Um, it's hashtag MCN Twitter voice, if you would be so inclined to use that. Um, if you have questions and you don't feel as comfortable uh, voicing them out loud, you, we are also using Twitter as a back channel today, so you can ask questions there and we'll check them at the end of the talk um, and see if anyone had any other questions that we can ask up here. So thank you. Um, so talking a little bit about the goals for this session, we're going to talk about empowering, um, empowering you to think about how you could use Twitter to share out what's happening in your education or learning departments, um, and how we empower others at our institutions through training to use Twitter. Uh, collaboration, how we collaborate across different departments and with each other, and how Twitter is a collaborative tool. Um, engagement, how we engage and connect with different audiences using Twitter. Um, and then a voice, either providing a voice that is consistent with your institution, developing a voice for your own learning channel, and finding your voice here as we discuss this topic. Um, so I'm going to just briefly tell you who's up here on the panel, and then we're going to use our first question to really dig in and introduce ourselves and talk about how we use Twitter. Um, so I'm Miranda Kerr. I'm from Shedd Aquarium. We also have Sarah Elliott from the Royal Ontario Museum, Laura Hoffman um, from the Phillips Collection, and Cynthia Razzo from the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center. And we sat in order, so nice job. Okay. <laughs> um, so our first question is going to be, why are we here? Um, why do we have separate education accounts at our institutions? And how do we fit into the larger um, institutional accounts on Twitter? So Laura is going to go first. All right. We, we have to move these closer. So that's what we've been instructed to do. So I'm Laura Hoffman. I am the manager of K-12 Digital and Educator Initiatives. Got to be close here. At the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. We are America's first modern art museum. And I run the PRISM K-12 account. Um, PRISM K-12 is kind of an offshoot brand off of the Phillips collection. It is an arts integration methodology that we use with our educators. So our audience is educators. And because of that, we decide to break it off because really our audience core is educators. When we were doing research and, and setting the foundation for what PRISM K-12 arts integration strategies would be and who our main audience would be, uh, we were looking out for teachers within their first five years of becoming teachers and entering the profession and found that there was a real need for them to connect and be part of their professional learning community. And digital was a really good way and through social media. So we focused our attentions on Twitter and Pinterest to do that. All right, um, next up we have Sarah. Um, so I'm Sarah. I am the learning content producer at the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, I don't know why the pictures have gone away, but we're working on that. Um, I uh, do a lot of the work around any digital content that goes up around our learning portal, and I do um, a lot of the tweeting for at ROM Learning. Uh, we actually have a team of tweeters, which we'll get into later, um, but quite often it's me. And our channel actually began um, a few years ago as a completely different channel. It was at ROM Hands-On, and it began because because of the nature of the hands-on galleries at the ROM, we do a lot of really cool programming, like we're gonna be handling some stick bugs right now, but it's entirely dependent on whether the volunteers have showed up and everybody's sick, so we can't really publicize it. So it began as a way to let the public know that these um, spot programs were popping up due to actual demand by people in the museum. And then as that channel picked up a little bit, we started to realize that um, there was an audience of teachers that we were gaining who liked the kind of uh, kid accessible facts that we were tweeting out and that there was a whole audience there that um, wasn't really um, being communicated with. So we worked on building up that audience and then rebranded as ROM Learning. Um, so right now we tweet about um, the school visits programs, the hands-on galleries, and our traveling exhibitions. I'm up next. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Miranda Kerr, and I work at Shedd Aquarium. 
So Shutter Cream has a main Twitter channel um, with lots of followers. And the main thing they talk about is um, customer engagement. We tell um, stories about our animals. We tell stories about our exhibits. Um, but we didn't have a place to share a lot of content um, specifically about what's happening in our learning programs. Um, and we have a learning staff of around 35 to 40 people that are in three different departments. Um, and we were taking teenagers out in the field and doing marine biology, or we were building robots, or we had um, other programs going on that we really wanted to get that story and that voice out. And so we made a case and we developed um, a strategy for why we wanted to have a channel, what the goals would be, what our audience would be, what would we be talking about, here's our examples, and we presented a really well thought out case and were able to have that uh, Twitter channel. Um, Shed Aquarium also has a research channel and a Great Lakes channel, so we have four channels, um, and we meet about once a month and kind of just talk about what we're talking about that month, if there are ways for us to interact, like when Chicago had Museum Week, we kind of all jumped on the themes and figured out how we were gonna share out, um, but sometimes we share completely different things, um, and that's okay. Okay, too. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And then Cynthia. Hi. So I'm Cynthia Rosso, and I work at the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center. Um, so we're a little bit different than the rest of the panelists. Um, the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center is actually a school um, serving um, infants up to kindergartners. And just a little bit of organizational history. Um, we are actually not part of the Smithsonian. We have a contract with them. So it gives us... Um, a little bit of a different perspective um, and a little bit more latitude um, in terms of being a separate nonprofit. Um, but we're very much connected to the Smithsonian community. And um, I think some of our goals are really to engage um, early learning professionals and thinking about how to use not just museums, but informal learning spaces in general. We're looking at a lot at what the rest of the Smithsonian is doing in terms of early learning and um, really wanting to present a picture about what we're doing and what our methodology and pedagogy is at the school. So our second topic that we're going to go into is how do you, how does your target audience change the approach and how you're sharing on Twitter? Um, and this time Cynthia is going to start. Um, so like I said, we're, we're looking at our early learning educators, our teachers, and um, one of the ways that we're really trying to reach out to them is by, um, we do regular blogs that are reflective teacher feature blogs. So looking at what folks are doing um, in the galleries and whether it's working or whether it's not working. And so we're often tweeting out about that, but we're also thinking very seriously about other curated content in regards to um, education in general, um, earning early learning um, in particular. and um, because we also offer a lot of professional development to both museum educators and um, early childhood educators, we're thinking um, a lot about um, giving them information about the workshops we're offering, but we do it in a way that we sort of um, provoke them with these thoughts. So um, that's one way we reach them. And of course, um, our families and early learners, um, really important for us um, thinking about um, the children and being able to, um, in early learning, we think a lot about documentation, like really documenting how the children are learning, how they're progressing, how they're developing. So we think of our, um, our Twitter content as, as demonstrating that, those things. Um, and so you'll often see these sort of moments of wonder and curiosity in our Twitter feed. Um, but we also see them as moments to um, help parents in modeling the type of work that they can do with their own children. Thank you. Um, and sorry, I should have mentioned we skipped to this slide. We kind of put together a Venn diagram. We know that on Twitter you're talking to everyone because it's an open public platform, but we have some different audiences that we're targeting, like Cynthia mentioned. Um, so Sarah is going to explain the audiences they target next. Um, so uh, like Miranda said, we do have tweets that are relevant to everybody in this diagram, but we focus in particular on um, educators and parents and families, and we're starting to get into teens and youth. And that audience that we're looking for tends to vary throughout the week. We focus more on the teacher audience during um, Monday to Friday because we know that's who's in the museum most. And then we shift over to content that's more um, relevant and engaging for um, parents and families on site because their numbers start to go up on the weekend. So knowing kind of who's in the building and who's interested in your programs often changes the kinds of tweets that you start to tweet out. And you do start to develop um, sort of a, a template for the things that you know people respond to really well. And 
Um, we're also starting to shift the focus a little bit because as our channel has started to pick up and as we started to engage more, we're finding that the visitors are now generating a lot of our content for us. Um, now that they know that we're there, now that we know that we're open, um, they actually will tag us and they will loop us in and we don't have to go looking for their tweets anymore. So we can just signal boost them and that gets the message across about what's going on, which is really, really great. Um, but one of the things we always try to keep in mind is with the nature of our particular channel, um, there's more than one person tweeting from it, but we always want to maintain that we have a very um, casual, informal, really welcoming um, voice to the channel. It's all about sort of wonder and discovery and just loving what is in the museum and what we're doing. Awesome. So Laura is up next. Hello again. Can you guys hear me okay? Is that better? I think it doesn't pick up. Okay, so with PRISM K-12 and working with teachers, um, mine's a little more, very, it's very focused on educators, and educators are directly tweeting from their accounts. So in my interaction as kind of the sole proprietor of the PRISM K-12 account, it's really how can we help connect and foster that professional learning community through it. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the trainings that I do, but also, um, in terms of what we capture, it's kind of what Sarah was saying where we use the hashtag so that the teachers can directly use the Prism K-12 hashtag and see what other teachers are doing. And we try on my end to capture both the what's happening at the museum as well as what's happening in classroom progress because that's really important too since we're expanding it more toward the national audience as well. Um, and then you'll notice for Shed Learning's account, I have kind of buckets all over this. The main thing that we share from our channel is the learning that's happening. So we have uh, live tweets coming out of any of our programs on any given day on our channel, whether that is students in the field, uh, field trip programs that are happening, or any of the programs in our building. So we kind of look at our audience as anyone who's interested in what SHED is doing in education. And so sometimes that's academia. We share out when any of our staff are at conferences or have published an, um, a new paper or something along those lines. That's educators, especially because we have classrooms that visit. Um, one of the things that I actually learned from Sarah is to tweet directly at schools. And we started doing that to get more engagement with, uh, with schools. So I, we look up in our database who's visiting today on a field trip and we tweet directly at them. Um, in terms of teens and youth, it's about giving them a voice. We recently, as this summer, started letting teens get trained to tweet from our channel, and they do it with staff supervision, um, but it's hashtag shed teen work study, and you'll see teens who are sharing out what that program means to them in their words and their photos. Um, and then another one I think is really fun is thinking about that parent audience. Um, so we always let parents know if we're going to be tweeting about a program, and the best is when I see the Twitter eggs pop up that are liking our tweets because it's a parent who wants to see what their kid is doing and has never been on Twitter. So they make an account just so they can follow um, what their student is doing in that program. Um, so, And then we also, um, for the teacher audience, like I mentioned, tweeting at schools, we also empower teachers to tweet and share back at us. So um, the hashtag ShedROV has a lot of content because it's teachers who are building robots with their students through a partnership with Shed. So that is our who we're talking to. Um, so for our third topic, we're going to talk about how do you equip staff and your audience to tweet from and interact with your channel. So what kind of training is happening? How do you feel like your staff is ready to do this or the people you want to talk to are ready to do this? And that's broken up into three buckets. So some of us are going to talk in each of the buckets, but we're going to look at how we train staff, how we train teachers, and how we train or talk to parents about our Twitter channel. Um, Oops, sorry. So Cynthia is going to talk first about staff training. So um, just to clarify, when I say um, staff, I'm really talking about the staff who work specifically on our outreach programming. Um, so that staff, um, we're lucky enough to, um, because we're a school, again, to use um, Shutterfly. And so we um, sort of train the weekend staff that's coming in to look at um, what our curriculum is and the types of things that we're trying to achieve, um, then to think a little bit about aesthetics, and then they can put um, a lot of the documentation on our Shutterfly account, so we, that's one way of doing things. And then the other way is that we are lucky enough now, um, or I'm lucky enough now to have two staff 
um, who help me with um, social media. And what I have found is that we kind of do an apprenticeship with them. Um, and so especially on Twitter, because um, the staff that I've interacted with has the most difficulty with Twitter. Um, so we kind of do an apprenticeship and go through and work together. Um, and um, after that apprenticeship, I kind of give them off onto their own. And it's been pretty successful, so. Great. Um, so for us at SHED, in, um, in the learning division, we have 35 to 40 people, but only two people that work on digital. And so at first, I tried to be the only person managing Twitter. Um, and that proved impossible because I had to be there for every program, every Saturday. It just, we didn't have, I didn't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. And so instead, we went to an empowerment model. And we're at a point now where I think around 15 to 20 of our staff, I consider Twitter trained. And so they go through a Twitter 101 with me. So if they've never done Twitter, that's fine. I will convert them. We will learn Twitter together. Um, and we talk about like, what is a hashtag? What is a handle? And we start very basic and I walk them through it. I encourage them to create a Twitter account of their own so they can kind of play around. Um, and then we move up and then I have a PowerPoint training specifically on the voice of shed learning. So as an institution, you probably have some kind of brand voice, some certain rules about what pictures you can share. Um, for us personally, we don't allow any behind the scenes photos um, just because we have a, a live collection of animals. We're very careful about how and where we share. Um, and so we have some rules like that that we go through. I have in the PowerPoint, like I literally make them do practice tweeting with me where I have a picture and I cover up the description and I ask them to write a description and think about what hashtags they would use. And so we go through that so that everyone feels super comfortable. And what that does is that empowers them to be able to share from their programs um, and feel like that they can share at any time. So at any given time, there's multiple voices sharing on our channel of what's happening in our programs. And it started to be interesting to see how those staff share differently. Like some of the staff that shared from our high school marine biology program in the Bahamas, there was like all these streams of emoticons, which is totally fine, not typically my style, but there was staff who would like, snail, wave, dolphin, HSMB is in the Bahamas. So it's just, it's kind of fun to see how our different staff um, share in different ways. Um, so that's our main um, training for staff. And then Sarah's up next. Um, so we are really fortunate at the ROM that we have Ryan Dodge in charge of all of our social media, and he is at the back of the room, and uh, amazing at giving us the tools that we need institutionally. He, he, he was summoned. Um, giving us the institutional tools we need to do this. So all of our training is really following on the work that Ryan and his team are doing. And really what we're doing in our training is giving our teachers specific tools that they need to do what we're asking them to do. Because um, like with Miranda, um, I can't be doing all of it. It's just, it's way too much work and, and this isn't my job. My job is this, tweeting is that part of it. So when we do training, we do a lot of um, opportunities to practice. We're working on right now a flipped training model where they get the theory on their own time and we can spend our really valuable face-to-face -face time with part-time staff actually working on things and workshopping. Um, but we will also give people specific examples of if you are setting up your class and you have 10 seconds, take a picture of the neatest thing that you have and then while you're waiting in the bullpen for your class to arrive, send out a tweet about a cool fact about this thing and here's the hashtags you need and here's the, the at mentions that you need. And we've actually... Um, changed our schedule up, because we do the, the Twitter polls as well, where we check who's in the building, and then tweet, here's what we're learning today. Um, and we've started adding the hashtags to the schedules that are posted every day that our teachers check in the morning so that they can see, oh, the class I'm teaching is on Twitter, here is their handle, I should tag them while I'm setting up my lab. So really, really specific tools telling them, here's the things that are useful for us, here's what we need you to do. Um, and that can be really empowering because Twitter is a huge, huge sandbox to play in and it can be really, really overwhelming, especially for the first timers. So, yeah. So mine's a lot smaller too. And because I'm working with teachers, they're honestly not checking it quite as frequently as some of the other audiences. So I handle it pretty much on my own. And I do have a social media background in my previous position. I oversaw all the institutional ones. So it was a pretty easy transition. And I also already knew the social media manager for the Phillips main account. So 
we work very closely together and actually I kind of take over monthly for these break for art Twitter chats, which are educational account where we look at one piece of artwork really slowly using the inquiry method. So it really doesn't have to do necessarily with PRISM, but it's education seeping into the main educational account. And so we do a ton of cross promotion and it feeds really well. Um, the only staff I really train about it is my interns because I'm working on strategy to make it a part of a bigger, broader education reform piece. So looking at the influencers and bigger hashtags to kind of broaden it up. So that's where we are right now with that. And then are we ready to skip to teachers? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cynthia is going to kick us off talking about how we train teachers. So. Um, for the, the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center, we do a lot of this professional development for teachers, and um, thus far, I haven't been heavily involved in that, so I'm personally still kind of working through how best to, um, to engage those teachers to be um, more active on Twitter with us. Um, I will just very briefly mention that in terms of our teachers that are in the classroom on a daily basis, um, uh, I'm currently working with our administrative team to really think about um, how and what the teachers are um, putting out there. And again, we're thinking a lot about how to tie that back to our curriculum document um, so that they understand that um, what they're putting out there is reflective of the philosophies that the school has. Um, but we also have the added um, benefit <laughs> or of really having to be very thoughtful about how our educators are um, using any um, photos um, that they're putting out on their on their personal feeds, and so that has been something that we're really um, thinking through and um, continuing to um, move forward on. Yeah, I think we're up. Laura. So for training teachers, for me is interesting because they are all tweeting out on their own accounts, um, and it's kind of twofold. So on one hand, I work with teacher cohorts, which are typically four to six months. They're grant-funded stipends, and they're working together in these partner schools um, with small teacher teams. So they're really tweeting out their in-classroom process and showcasing PRISM K-12 in action. And what I've learned in, in being at this position for about a year is that I do a lot of evaluation, and I do some formative, and teachers say they're very comfortable with Twitter accounts, but then, you know, you get there and they really aren't. So I've started integrating social media boot camps as part of their teacher institutes, where it's basically doing the nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. even if they already have Twitter accounts, because even the ones that do, they really haven't done as much as I think they, they might think they do in terms of what we're asking of using pictures and or videos and using the right hashtags. So um, they've really enjoyed that part. And it's interesting because they think it's like super innovative where it's really like a 101 type stuff. So that's been great. And then also uh, I've just been trying to implement it too into these broader regional events too where I'm not having the same level of engagement where I'm working with them for four to six months, but just having them, you know, I live tweet throughout the event. I'm putting it in the programs. Mm -hmm. I'm putting it within the activities and exercises we're trying. So just getting teachers comfortable and showcasing that it's a really good resource for them, even if they're not comfortable tweeting out per se. Yeah, and I think that that is very similar to how we work with teachers in both examples. Um, we have a hashtag shed educator that we use at any educational pro professional development or anything we do with teachers. So they know if they follow that hashtag, anything that comes up for them um, is available. And we have signs and we announce it at the beginning of like a conference day or something like that. And then our hashtag shed ROV program, that was one of our original ha program hashtags that we used. And we kind of encouraged teachers to use it. We put it on buttons. We said they should. Um, but we realized that they needed more help than that and some of them wanted to be a part of that community but didn't know how and so that program is a year-long program where teachers are trained to build a robot with students and so we added a component to the professional development day in October where they got basically a social media boot camp they learned how to use Twitter they right there in a computer lab with us could sign up for an account and get hand one-on-one -on -one help to get that started and we've seen the um, amount of engagement with that really grow and grow and then we made a point at each of our um, like our underwater robotics has like a club event like a celebration 
celebration and then a competition. And at both of those events, we've done extra activities on social media, like a scavenger hunt. If they do all these different types of photos and tweet them with the hashtag, they win a prize um, and just creating that engagement. And it's made it so a lot of them, it became part of their practice. And even if you search it right now, you have teachers who shared like this week what their, cl what their club is up to building their robot. Um, so I think that if you give them the tools, they're more than willing to do it. I just think they need to get to that point where they feel comfortable. Um, we don't actually have anything like a teacher social media boot camp, but now I really want one because uh, that's awesome. Um, we're with the, the visiting teachers as opposed to the teachers who teach lessons within the museum. Um, we have smaller tools available to help them, um, even just to let them know that this opportunity for communication is out there um, because it's, it's a very big organization and a lot of times the messaging can get lost. So we do actually include it in the communications we have when they're booking their visits. Um, we have signage at the entrance when they check in to let them know that this particular channel exists for them. Um, one of the things that we have started to do now is we're adding the widget with um, the ROM Learning Twitter feed to the sites that we know that the teachers are visiting. And when we're giving our um, sort of exit speech to the teachers when we finish the lessons, um, Hands up, everybody who teaches lessons within a museum. So, both. Um, there is never enough time to cover everything. And especially right at the end, once they've started to become comfortable with you, all of the questions start to come out and you can't get to them all. So it's been really useful to say to um, the classroom teachers, you know, this has been really great. I know you still have lots of questions, so tweet those questions to us and we can answer them later. Um, what that does is it provides them um, with the invitation. They know that we want to have these questions because sometimes just getting the invitation is enough. Um, but what it also does is it encourages them to share what they are creating and how they're applying the knowledge that they get in their lessons, which for, for us, um, especially when we're writing reports and going back to the board and going back to donors, having these concrete examples of what the classes are actually doing with what they learn is absolutely invaluable. Um, so having that just really quick conversation at the end has been really useful for us. Um, and it also kind of lets them connect with the channel and it shows them what other teachers are doing and what other teachers are saying. Even just when we're doing those tweets to the schools every day, including a question of what are you learning or what is your favorite thing that you learned, giving them something to answer can empower them to actually do it. Um, so we're going to move to um, how you work with parents or families or caregivers to equip. Um, the one thing I mentioned earlier where the main thing we do is just letting parents know. Um, that gives them the space to be able to follow more about what their students are doing. We tested out a few things where we would tweet questions at the end of our camp of like, hey, parents, ask your camper about this today. It gives them a place to um, have a conversation with their student. Um, you have to make sure that it's something that not everyone has to do because not everyone has the ability to to get on the internet on a daily basis or wants to be on Twitter, but it's just kind of an extra bonus that we tried out. Um, I mentioned that some of them, you can see the Twitter eggs pop up. But one thing to note, if you do share on social and you tell parents, making sure that you include every every student or every participant in that program in some way. Um, we had parents that would tweet us on Twitter and we're like, I don't see my kid in this photo. <laughs> okay, we'll make sure that we're in the next photo. But, but sometimes it's because they um, are not as familiar with Twitter. So if you search a hashtag, it shows you the top tweets, and if you don't click live or all the tweets, so they were just seeing like the top three, but if they'd clicked live, their kid was in one of the photos, I promise, but they just didn't see it. So sometimes you're guiding them through it of like, perhaps you haven't seen this tweet, or we'll be sure to tweet more tomorrow, and just be aware that if you open it to parents that you may get some of those responses. So, so um, it's, the parents are an interesting dilemma for the for us because um, during our weekend programs, we actually encourage them to put their phones away. I mean, part of the program is this idea that you know you're together with your child and this is quality time. And please, unless you're taking a photo. Um, so what we try to do is just subtly remind our families, um, especially as we leave um, as we leave our classroom space and go into the gallery space, um, is to remind them um, that they can follow us. Um, and if they want to, they can certainly share. 
Um, and we also have our um, school parents. And uh, I see less interaction um, with our school parents um, on Twitter, but on other platforms. And that's definitely more about community making and being excited that they're seeing their children or a teacher or an educator being featured that they have had a personal relationship with. And Sarah, did you have anything you want to add? Um, sure. So um, with us, I think with the parent audience, that's where um, ROM Learning actually works closest with at ROM Toronto. Um, we're in the hands-on galleries is where we see most of the parents. And we do have signage letting them know that you know ROM Learning's around and we can tell you cool stuff about the hands-on galleries, but they miss those because you know parents are focused on their kids running around the galleries. They don't have time to look at all the signs. And again, as we all know institutionally, there's a lot of stuff on the walls to read. Um, so they will often tweet tagging in at ROM Toronto and um, our team, Ryan and, and his people, are amazing at finding those and signal boosting and tagging us in on them so that if we haven't seen it, we know that they're there. Um, and then institutionally, we have institutional hashtags that we'll use, like hashtag ROMMB for March break. So we know that for things like that, where parents are really interested in what's special, what's unique, what's going on, we already have, um, thanks to at ROM Toronto, a platform that parents are going to be looking at that we can tap into and say, like, here's specifically what's happening in um, hands-on bio today. Like, check it out. The cockroach is molting. Check it out. The tarantula is eating a bug. Um, and it really opens up the audience, and it gives those parents, again, tools to kind of say, oh, here's where I want to go on my visit, here's where I want to do. I have questions about this and asking them further. So you know, working with the rest of the institution is, is really powerful in that respect. Um, so we have two more topics. We're going to move into successes and challenges. Um, for successes, I just wanted to make a note that when we started to talk about this topic, we kind of brainstormed the four of us, and there was a lot of common themes I'll just mention, and then we'll delve into some examples. Um, but just to note, when you have a separate channel for learning or education, something like five retweets may be a huge success for you, which is very different than your main channel, which may have tens of thousands of followers. Um, when you have a couple thousand followers, five retweets is exciting. Um, Twitter's not our whole job. For all of us up here, we're not just social media managers. That's a small part of what we do. We're also potentially running programs or managing other aspects of digital at our institutions. Um, sometimes we're tweeting when a program is happening, which is not always a peak time on Twitter. So Twitter has like peak windows around like lunchtime or dinner time or late at night. Um, and that's not necessarily when our programs are happening. So just being aware of that. Um, we all use Twitter analytics to kind of get a pulse of um, what is getting a lot of uh, feedback, what, it, what are people interested in. Um, and then sometimes we'll take pictures when we're in the middle of a program and something's happening, and then we end up tweeting later, um, almost like a later gram, but except it's happening on Twitter. Um, and then success for us is also making sure we let our learners share their voice, and that varies for our different institutions, but really making sure that if you're going to be an education or learning channel, your learner has to have a place there. Um, so we'll have a few examples. We'll start with Cynthia. Um, so just in terms of, you know, some of our, I think, what are more, our more successful strategies, um, it's definitely thinking about um, looking, again, across the board at the whole Smithsonian. We're, we're lucky enough to kind of go out and, you know, see what's happening at every museum and um, share whether it be our work or another institution's work um, with, with these young learners in the gallery. Um, um, being able, I think one of our benefits is being able to create some of that um, that original content. Um, so I know for a lot of museums, there's a, a, a more laborious process to getting your blog content up, and we have you know we have more say in that. So being able to tweet out about um, you know what our teachers are doing, and again, a, giving a really authentic and honest look at that is um, very important to us. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, you know, we were talking about learner experience, or, and um, I think for us is because we work with young children and they don't have a voice per se quite yet, um, we are really trying to um, capture a moment um, of, um, that really reflects um, you know, what can happen in these informal learning spaces. And um, it can happen on, you know, many different levels. So that is really, you know, our main objective, um, you know, when we're talking about that learner experience, like how it can happen and on, and in different ways that we can make that happen. 
Uh, for me, the biggest success is being able to use uh, Twitter to showcase Prism K-12 in action because Prism K-12 doesn't necessarily mean anything to anyone, but through doing the trainings and understanding, it's really about arts integration and breaking down those barriers. So we work with a lot of teachers that aren't, don't even have art programs in their schools. So being able to showcase what that means so other teachers can see is, is really the best way for us to show success and have also with that other piece is being able to foster that conversation for these teachers who feel like maybe they don't have the support or don't aren't able to get that outside perspective and that's why they really want to connect. So I'm still experimenting with a lot of ways to make that even stronger and I just started creating a Twitter list for the different cohorts so to try and get you utilize each other more so that I'm not the only kind of authority on this but and starting a mentorship program. So as I'm expanding these cohorts to a more national audience, I want to try and do a local and national mentorship program where they're connecting and through one way would be through Twitter. So I'm still playing with that as well as trying to really get it within the larger education reform model. So it's very much a work in progress and I, I've seen little changes and I think as, as Miranda said, like, that's big. You know, I've had teachers who've said, I've never done Twitter before, and I look through, and they're the best teacher in my cohort at tweeting. You know, they're doing it regularly. They're doing it more than I asked. So uh, it's like these small changes, which, which are huge. Um, and I've talked a lot about like staff empowerment and how we do the trainings. In addition to that, I would say something that's been really successful for us is I have a document I call a social media plan. And almost every single program that happens within learning has a social media plan. And it's just a simple template I made, but it has like goals. Why are we talking on social media? And for us, our main channel is Twitter. We have a few other ones we play around with, but for the most part, it's Twitter. Um, and then it takes through like, what hashtags are we going to use? Like, is there a program hashtag? Are there other hashtags that are relevant, like hashtag STEM, hashtag Great Lakes, other ones that we use? Um, what are the roles? Like, am, am I doing the tweeting? Is one of them trained and they're doing the tweeting? Who's going to pull together all the information at the end? Who do we need to train? What else needs to happen? And so it's very, like, very detailed. And... Um, it's one more form they have to fill out. I know you probably fill out a lot of forms in your departments, but then it sets them up to be empowered to feel like they can tweet and say what they need to say and share that story because they've been told that you are cleared to do this and this is a great idea and everyone's on board. And so I think having some kind of structure is actually freeing um, and allowing them to do that. Um, and I think success is also letting go in a way. Um, like I said, hashtag shed ROV has kind of just taken off and that's great because then all I have to do is retweet those teachers that are already sharing the amazing robotics that's happening in those programs. Um, so that's exciting. And then um, the other thing we do is the reason we have so many program hashtags, and I think we're up to like 15 or 16 now, um, is because then I can capture each program as a digital story. So we use story Storify, and I make a Storify for almost every single program because it's free. It's a really simple tool, easy to use. Um, I have a training on that too, <laughs> if anyone's interested. Um, but then I'm able to like capture these stories that we can share um, with evaluation reports that we need to share, with higher ups in our organization that want to know like what a program looks like, let me show you the Storify. And it has all of the pictures, all of the quotes from all of our learners, the tweets that they're sharing. It's like this great digital storytelling tool. So that's been another big success for us is having that in our, in our toolbox. Um, yeah, so that's everything for successes for me. Um, I'm going to second everything Miranda said about Storify because when you're doing training and you want an example for a particular group, if you have the stories already, you can be like, here's what this looks like. So it's great. Um, in terms of successful strategies, we've already talked about the daily tweets, but that is hands down like one of the most successful things we do. Um, when we look at the analytics, those kinds of tweets are regularly at the top in terms of impressions and engagements. Um, and when you look at who's retweeting them, I can't get into everybody's head, I can't think why, but it's a lot of the principals of the schools that we've tagged in, being like, hey parents, check out what the kids are doing. Um, and it's great because it gives a snapshot of what learning looks like in the museum without being an ad, um, which is really, really handy. Um, and I would say that um, sort of the other strategies that have worked really well is, um, 
I call it my stalker list. Um, I actually maintain lists of the schools that I know are coming in a particular week. And again, folding it into regular workflow is really important. So just as I need a five minute eye break from whatever I'm working on, I'll go over to my other screen, check out the list, and if there's a picture that looks like something that's relevant to one of our programs, I will check it out and see if I can start a conversation. And um, the photo that I have up on the, the slide behind us is an example of a class who were learning something about biodiversity. Um, I tagged in a photo of our biodiversity gallery and said, let us know if you have any questions. And they asked. And we replied with videos. And they said, that's great. We're going to come visit you. And they did. And the thing that we found, which was really remarkable about this group, and Mr. Wigmore's class, if anybody wants to know great ways that teachers are using tech in their classrooms, follow him. He's awesome. But um, what we found is that rather than the kids coming and getting a total stranger, they already had a personal connection with us. They recognized us by sight, they recognized us by name, and it was a level of interaction that we don't usually get because we usually have them in this silo. And they sent us what they'd done. They checked in with us. They're like, check out the mummy masks we're making. How are we doing? Do you have any suggestions? What colors are on the things in the galleries? So that is sort of our, our big, example that we have of what success looks like is this using Twitter to extend the museum visit before and after the on-site component. So there wouldn't be successes without challenges. Um, so we're also going to talk a little bit about some lessons we've learned and some obstacles we've overcome. And I think we're going to start with Laura this time. So I think we kind of mentioned this, that it does take a long time for the audience to grow. So just being patient is really important and knowing that it takes time and those small victories. Um, I think the biggest thing I, I learned was not making assumptions. As I mentioned before, you know, teachers might think that they have a stronger understanding or comfort level than when you actually do it. So in my social media trainings, I tried to make them very active and, and just talking to them and walking them through it. And that was really helpful because if I just went based on what they necessarily were saying, we'd never see any tweets or they never even create accounts. So it's just really, that was a really important growing process and also being really specific with them. When you, I like to keep things open, you know, I'm an educator, be very broad, but it's like, you got to be really upfront about if we're giving them grant funded stipends, what we're expecting in terms of digital return, you know, for the teacher PDs, that's much more open. Um, but I've kind of learned that with digital, it can be so scary. So being a little more specific doesn't, doesn't hurt that. So just um, kind of going back to that idea of like not to make assumptions. So um, when I started doing um, social media, I was, I'm, I'm a little bit older than a lot of you in the room. And so I assumed that if you were of a certain age group that you would feel really comfortable on Twitter. And I learned very quickly that that was not the case. Um, and that is really why I have kind of gone to that apprenticeship type of model. Um, and I'm lucky enough that I have a small enough staff that we can we can work together. Um, I think also important to remember, um, just in terms of staff, is um, you know obviously we don't want to make any big mistakes when we're putting things out there, but it's also okay to learn and 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 let your your tweets be an experience and to learn from them and to get comfortable in that position and allow that that time to um, allow people to have that time. Um, I think another huge challenge for us has been, again, going back to our audience, which is young children, and being very thoughtful about um, their privacy and how their parents feel about, you know, putting information about them or documenting them and putting them in the public eye. So that is something that we are trying to be more and more thoughtful about. Um, and finally, I think just the subject matter. So. Um, you know, we all like to see cute puppies and cute kids, but in fact, we don't see our, our I mean, we do think our kids are cute, our, the, you know, that are in our programs, but um, we see what's happening at the Early Enrichment Center is so much more than just a cute baby or, you know, a fun smile. And um, it's been really important for me to, um, to uh, communicate that to our staff and to people outside of the program so that they really understand that they were there for um, a much larger purpose. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I just wanted to echo the thought that um, along with people may not be comfortable on Twitter, also your audience may not want to use Twitter how you want them to. Uh, when we first started um, Hashtag Shed Stewards, which is a teen stewardship program, they go out and they remove invasive species or clean up garbage, and then they get to kayak or hike or something like that. So that's a picture in the upper right corner. Um, at first we had this whole thing where I passed out this little thing and I talked about how they should use Hashtag Shed Stewards, and I talked about what they might want to share. We had no teens do that. In a whole year, I think I got two Instagram posts because teens don't necessarily want to tell their friends they're picking up garbage on the weekends or cutting down invasive species. They think it's cool, but that's not what they're going to put on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so instead, we decided to use that hashtag for us to share. So this still has pictures of those teens doing the work in nature and a quote that says, this whole place used to be covered. And like, there's another kid in one of the pictures that says like, we're saving the world with loppers, which are like the tools you use to cut them down. So you can still capture that experience and share quotes and photos, but your teens may not want to share how you want them to share and just being aware of that. Um, I wanted to also make a note on establishing boundaries. Um, so Shed Aquarium, much like a lot of institutions, has official social media policies. But in learning, I actually take us a step further um, where I break it down for them what if they want to have a personal social media account versus a personal professional social media account. And if you say that you work at Shed Aquarium, um, I have some additional things I'd like you to do. If you're going to use our shed hashtags, like you can totally tweet pictures of robots at our hashtag shed ROV event, but that means that your your profile should be something that is representing our organization in a positive way. I'm not going to police or patrol you if you want to have your own personal account, but if our staff choose to have that professional account, that comes with certain um, boundaries to it. Um, and then uh, similar to that is privacy. Um, as we mentioned, we work a lot of times you have um, young learners. So we have photo release forms. Um, you can't take pictures of any kids without photo release forms. Um, just knowing that um, your, your institution may have its own policy. But I have gotten very creative at how I can take pictures without faces. Um, so for a lot of our field trip programs, we don't have photo releases because they're there for like an hour as opposed to a week long camp or something like that. So I'll take pictures of like our staff with kids back of heads or I'll zoom in on hands doing a squid dissection so that you can't see any faces. So you can still share the story. You just may have to get creative about how you uh, frame those pictures for your tweets. Yeah, on that note, I did find an app that has a tool to blur children's faces at a touch. So useful. Um, so uh, I would have to go back and look at it because I don't use it very often because I do the back of head thing most of the time. Um, <laughs> But you can tweet me after, and I will figure out which one it is, and I will let you know. Because um, I have about five that I was testing. Um, so just adding to what everyone else said, um, a couple of the really important things that we learned is when you start getting multiple people on the account, and we learned this the hard way, um, even if you're encouraging everybody to share on the main channel, you need to have a driver for the account for the day uh, for the questions that come in and the people tagging you in things. Because if you get three very keen, earnest people responding at the same time, you come across as a hot mess. Um, so, you know, I can be downstairs and someone else can be upstairs and we can be simultaneously tweeting. But if a question comes in, we know that I'm going to answer this question today. Julie's going to answer this question on Monday. Um, that was a really, really big one. Uh, the other one is always have a go-to folder of images on your desktop or on the device you're tweeting from because if you're tweeting about something cool going on, you don't have any media release kids, having a stock photo of kids doing cool things in the Egypt gallery will make that tweet go so much farther. Um, tweets without media attached will sink like a rock. Very few people will actually even look at them as they're scanning. Um, and kind of the, the last thing building on that is that um, stories in your tweets earn more engagements, more signal boosts um, than ads. So we can tweet about, you know, we have this program about biodiversity, here's a link to it, yay. Um, and that will, you know, some people will be interested, some people might ask questions, some people might retweet it. Then we had um, this school who came to visit make a video about their trip and send it to us, and we retweeted that. Um, Slate family is the family that provided the bursary that got that class to the museum. And that thing got so much engagement. Um, you know, people loved it. That was going everywhere because it was a cool story told by the kids in their own voice. And that was the key. That's what succeeded. 
So just to wrap it up, this is just a couple of the tools that we referred to, Storify. Um, I use TweetDeck. Some of us use Hootsuite. It's just ways to schedule tweets or kind of keep an eye on the different hashtags you have and lists you want to follow. Um, and then Twitter analytics. Um, I, I monthly kind of check our Twitter analytics just to get a feel. It seems like that's about where we're all at, just to kind of get a feel for what is doing well, what um, engagement you've had that month. Um, and then this is all of us again. Sarah, I'm so sorry. I don't know why your photos are pulling. I'll pull up the PDF so you can see Sarah's face. Um, but these are all of our handles again if you want to tweet at us. And then we have about like five or six minutes for questions. Um, and we would love to take your questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is all well and good about Twitter, but... Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll answer first, and I can pass it down. So the question, I just have to repeat it for the recording, was asking, like, Twitter is all well and good for now, but have you experimented with other platforms? Where is it going? Um, so the reason, one of the reasons that we chose Twitter, um, much like Laura said, for teachers are still on Twitter. Um, and they're on Pinterest as well. Um, but Twitter is a big place where it's public, and they can ask us questions, and we can share very freely. We have experimented with other things. We technically have a YouTube channel, but we more use it to house media. We don't really use it to, so people subscribe. Um, we have a Pinterest account, but we actually found that although we were sharing a lot of content, we just weren't getting the followers. So at least with Shed, we're in the process right now of moving the Shed Learning Pinterest with the main Shed Aquarium one and just combining our efforts because they had all the followers, we had all the content, we're going to work together. Um, in terms of an Instagram or a Facebook, right now, at least for Shed, uh, they just want to have a main channel version of that. Twitter seems like it's the place where we've gotten permission to have our own voice and our own channel. So that's why we are there. Um, at least for us right now, we haven't seen a decline. I mean, I guess it's possible that the channels will change and we're always willing to try new things. Um, but at least that's where we're at. I don't know if anyone has anything else. Yeah. Um, and echoing a lot of that, um, the at Rom Toronto is the channel that experiments with the different platforms. Um, Rom Learning does have its own Instagram. Uh, we don't use it as much because we it doesn't facilitate the kinds of conversations that we are currently having. And and as Miranda said, that is very much a product of the demographic that are teachers right now. Um, just the structure of Twitter facilitates the conversations a little bit better. Um, that said, again, we are very fortunate that we have a really strong social team. Uh, we will go where they follow. So if institutionally they decide we're gonna move over to Instagram, we're gonna do that. A lot of the strategies that we've developed on Twitter, um, the things that we found work, they will translate, maybe not um, the specific nitty gritty of what a post looks like, but the things that we know people respond to, that will translate to whatever social platform comes along the line. Yeah, we use uh, Twitter and Pinterest, and I find pretty good success on both of them. They do have their different uh, strengths, I think, for teachers. So teachers kind of like looking at Pinterest a lot, and it's very good for organizing. So I definitely want to keep using that. We also have an idea forum on our website that's specifically for teachers. It's teachers.phillipscollection.org. And that's something I'm more phasing out because I'm finding that more conversations are happening through Twitter as opposed to having to log on to see something on the website. So um, we're actually doing a new kind of game interactive for specifically for teachers to brainstorm lesson ideas and that I'm integrating with social media um, because in order to kind of push it out to something that they're already using. I know that teachers used to use Facebook groups a lot, but I've heard from various teachers that one, Facebook's blocked all the time at work, and two, the groups tend to get very stale for teachers, and there's just not the same level of engagement in these closed groups. So uh, I think a lot of people are moving away from that model. Yeah, so I will just echo, I think, uh, Twitter for, for teachers, and especially folks who are thinking, who are more thought leaders in education. I think Twitter is still a very viable platform. Um, however, um, we, some, the SEEK is very, very active on um, Instagram and um, Pinterest, and we do 
especially our um, early childhood educators are really excited. We get a lot of um, a lot of conversation going about ac specific activities that we put up. Um, we curate a lot of um, a lot of um, on Pinterest um, to to help teachers kind of find things by theme. Um, so so we're very busy on on both of those platforms as well. I can start if you want to. Um, yeah, so for at Shedda Graham, um, anyone who comes into our programs has to sign a photo release. That's an institution-wide thing. Um, so it's a little bit easier for us. So any program that's going to be longer than, say, an hour, they all have photo releases. And if we have a student who doesn't, it's a much more rare occurrence. Um, we have done things before where we had like the press come and, and do photos of a field trip. And so students that didn't have a photo release got like a wristband or a sticker or something so they were identified. Um, but for the most part, our staff know that any type of program, everyone's gonna be photo released unless there's an extreme circumstance and we've talked about it. For the, um, like our learning programs that take place on site, we don't tweet pictures of those daily. It's just every now and then and it's usually me. And so I'm the one who kind of goes in and, and frames it so that you can't see anyone's face. At least that's how we handle it. Um, yeah, so again, institutionally, you don't get on the account unless you've been approved by um, the the main institutional social training and the kinds of pictures you can take are a really big part of that. So when um, Ryan releases somebody to a ROM branded account, there is already a huge level of trust there. And that translates to the people that we bring onto the account get the training and they practice on their personal until we're really sure um, that they're going to be okay with this, that it becomes second nature. Um, and the second part of that is that, again, the great thing about being able to build up these conversations and get people responding to you is we don't have to do a lot of that anymore because the classroom teachers know their kids' media releases and we don't have to take the photos. They're doing it for us. So we're getting these great, beautiful, like, face shots of a 14-year-old looking into a microscope all intently, and, and they gave us that. Uh, we don't have to do it, so it's great. Uh, when I do site visits, I take the nice fancy camera. So what I do is I drop them all in a Google Drive, and then I tell the teachers you know, because they do know, I say, use whatever you want. And I always try and mix it up where I have a variety of backs of heads or super far away, as well as like the close-ups just kind of behind the head or some face shots. And then I just leave it up to them. But from my account, I only ever use ones where it's far enough away just, just to keep it on the safe side. Or if there's a program there, we try and get photo releases. So kind of vary it up. So in terms of our public programs, um, we do have all of our participants um, sign a waiver when they come in. So that's generally not been a problem for us. We've been lucky. Um, where we have to be more um, careful is actually because we have, we have like 135 students at the school. And um, parents are asked to sign a waiver now um, that, um, that goes through their, their tenure at SEEK. Um, so we have a two-fold process in that when we have new staff come on, we explain to them the importance of maintaining that privacy, but we have had mishaps. And um, so to be completely honest, um, it's something that we have to be really diligent about. Um, but I can say that um, the, the staff that I work with that is you know, posting things on our, on our SEEK accounts, they are very diligent. And so we actually have a, um, a PDF that goes out to everybody that's our do not photograph list. But things happen, like we were at an event um, last week and a photographer came and he was with another institution and I was like, whoa, we need to pull, you know, we either need to pull a child out and then we have to be very thoughtful about when we're pulling that child out of the group, how that makes that child feel or that parent feel. So it's, um, it's, you know, it's something that you just have to really stay on top of. I just want to make a quick note, because uh, we've been talking about kids. For photographing teachers, what I always do is, if it's a teacher cohort where it's grant-funded, 
I just make them sign a photo release and a film release when they, before they get that check. Um, but also, whenever I have big teacher programs, I always have um, a big sign right at the registration that's like, uh, about the consent, so um, that's just a safeguard. I've seen that at tons of museums. If you're interested in language, I'm happy to send it over to you. Any last questions? Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today to talk about Twitter. We can hang out up here if anyone had any other questions. Um, and we have some cards up here as well. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. Yeah.